Hello, my name is Dr. Katherine Richmond Cullen. I'm really happy to be with you today. I'd like to speak about how neuroscience has informed teaching and learning. So I'm going to be discussing this through several slides this afternoon, and I hope that you take away something from my presentation. Thank you for being here. The researchers, Jeffrey and Renata Kane, have presented a theory that there are several learning principles that apply to our brain and how it is created. And five of them are listed here. Um, I will discuss each of these individually throughout the presentation, but I'd like to show you them as a whole right now. Uh, the Keynes say that all learning is physiological, that every brain is unique, as unique as our fingerprints are unique, as unique as every child in your classroom or under your care has a different way of learning and a different um, brain, if you will. Learning is developmental, and I'm going to discuss a theorist who has indicated through his research that there may be a difference between a learning disability and learning dormancy due to lack of stimulation in certain areas of the brain. Learning is social, and at this time of COVID-19, this has been quite the challenge for teachers and for others to work with groups of people. We are meant to learn together. We are meant to discuss issues. We are meant to share and process that which is learned together. And as COVID has certainly arrested that for many people, especially in our schools. Um, the search for meaning is innate. So above all else, we look for meaning in anything that we are presented with in terms of learning new material. The first learning principle that the Keynes discuss is that all learning is physiological. And the concept of learning being physiological, like breathing is a physiological process of the lungs, like blood flow is a physiological process of the circulatory system. Um, learning is the physiological process of the brain. And if a physiological process can be controlled through exercise or medication, such as the respiratory system, the circulatory system, then the theory is that the physiological process of learning of the brain can be manipulated. And the way to do that would be through effective teaching that stimulates the brain and that stimulates the full brain, not just part of the brain. So what we're learning about physiology through a neuro imagery is that through specific instructional processes, we can alter neural patterns in um, children's minds. The first area to be activated during the process of learning is the reticular activation system. And what happens is data comes through the brainstem and is sent directly to the executive assistant of the brain, that is the RAS. And in this process, the senses are stimulated and data is sent to the diencephalon, but only data that is screened as being non-threatening and or important to survival, which is the actual reason we have a brain to begin with. So remembering that sensory stimulus is first and that there is a screening system. As I mentioned, the second area to be stimulated is the diencephalon where the limbic system is contained. And the limbic system is responsible for emotional response to data. So if the learner is in a place where he or she is not feeling threatened or not anxious, but rather interested and stimulated by the data that is being presented by the instructor, then the process of learning continues. And if the student is not feeling comfortable or is hyperstimulated, then it is a fright flight situation where 
learning stops. So we know that the brain will continue the learning process if there is emotional connection and emotional stability. So this is very important that for the learner, we set up a condition of homeostasis where the brain is ready to go, ready to roll, and that the child, student, or client has an emotional connection to the data in, in that I have, I'm making meaning from this data. This data is important to me. The cerebral cortex is the next area of the brain to be stimulated. And there are four lobes in the cerebral cortex. This is where cognition occurs. And the first thing the brain does is look for stored data in long-term memory that is connected to that new data that is being presented. So the brain stores throughout the entire cerebrum and depending on how the instruction went in the first place. But we know as educators that the more we stimulate students in visual, auditory, and kinesthetic ways, we can engage more of the cerebrum, more of the cognitive mind, and then we can, through a process of um, of metacognition help students strengthen neural activation patterns, neural pathways. And so it is really important as an instructor that we look at the four lobes of the brain and stimulate each one of those in our lessons. So obviously the parietal lobe, as you can see on the screen, is associated with um, sensory stimulation, perceptual ability of the mind, and uh, visual perception, as well as auditory, but also with movement. So it is the area of the brain that is the perceptual area of our brain. The occipital um, lobe has to do with visual processing. The temporal lobe is best associated with auditory stimulus and processing. And the frontal lobe contains the area of our brain where we problem solve, where we self-regulate, where we learn to plan, and the executive functions are held in the frontal lobe. And by executive function, I mean that um, the brain's ability to problem solve, self-regulate, and plan. So this is a very strategic area of the brain. Working memory is also contained in the frontal lobe. And we will speak about that in, um, in a few minutes. So in summary, we need to stimulate the full brain. The learning process can be summarized as well in an elegant way by just looking at five simple steps. There's much more going on, trust me. But for the purposes of today, if we think about how to best teach our students or engage people in a learning circumstance, we have to remember the brain receives information through our senses first. So we need to stimulate the senses. Then we know that there has to be an emotional connection for the process to continue. So we try to make the information we're presenting meaningful to our class, to our participants, to those to whom we're presenting. So making meaning and setting up an emotionally safe place to learn is very important for the learning process to continue. Once again, the brain searches for stored information in the cerebrum throughout the separate lobes, and it looks to bring forth that which it knows in long-term memory to the learning episode. Working memory is then stimulated in the frontal lobe, and working memory is interesting because it is aligned to chronological age of the student. So for students who are very young, they have a very short working memory capacity. It is approximately the number of minutes that they are in chronological age. So very young children, seven years old, would have about seven minutes of working memory, seven minutes of attention. After that time, they need lots and lots of to process that which they've learned. So 
the best teaching is short bursts of information and lots of time for process. So the older the student gets, the more working memory is available to them. Um, the attention span grows, but by high school, it's about 15 minutes. So any person that is in a lecture without any processing certainly can't really pay attention for longer than perhaps an adult is a half hour, which is how long I intend to speak to you today. Because unfortunately, in the virtual world, we don't have an opportunity in a taped presentation to process with you. But after that, the most important part of a lesson is that we provide closure for the brain. So after new information is learned, we need to connect that new information to that which the brain has stored. So if you will, on the slide, we connect purple to red by providing closure activities. The brain stores information sequentially. So we have to help the learner remember what he or she did and reiterate that which he or she learned verbally, um, you know, visually, drawing, remembering, talking, remembering, and setting up a, an actual pattern for the brain to connect old to new and then uh, place that information in long-term memory through neural connections. And um, one of the uh, researchers that I have read um, was quoted to say, neurons that are wired together fire together. So the more we connect across the cerebrum, the more we connect the ways we process information, the stronger the neural connections are and the better the long-term memory. Many things are remembered by the mind, but it is retrieval that's important. So um, if we um, address convergence zones in the brain, such as converging the parietal and the temporal lobes, helping kids learn in many different modalities, then the neural pathways are strengthened, the patterns are strengthened, and information can be better retrieved when students are asked to retrieve. So it can be a test situation or a discussion. So returning to the brain principles, we see that indeed learning is physiological. We know that every brain is unique, so every brain learns differently. Learning is a developmental process, and I will speak about that next. We need to be social, and the brain looks for meaning. Now, the idea that learning is developmental has been researched by many, many researchers, but a gentleman by the name of Dr. Steve Pfeiffer discusses the concept that perhaps learning disability is not necessarily what we name it, but rather a dormancy in neural activity. So his quote directly is that educators armed with the appropriate interventions can actually alter neural activations and activating patterns in the developing brain. So for young children, if we teach a certain way or we address areas where there may not be neural stimulation as discovered through either testing or neural imaging, we can determine perhaps what interventions we can use to assist the child or the learner in developing that area of the brain. So think of having any kind of atrophy in your muscle. If you work on it, the muscle strengthens and there is change. It's the same idea. The physio physiological aspects of learning can be changed or the brain can be changed due to the correct intervention. So something called neuroplasticity refers to the fact that our brain is equipped to change and will change if provided with effective stimulation for neural activation patterns. So I find this very interesting from the standpoint of um, labeling children uh, as disabled when we could look at that differently and think, what can we do 
um, as any doctor would do, to assist the physiological process to arrest deterioration or enhance the physiological process of certain systems of the body so that um, a child could become better equipped to learn a content such as mathematics or English language arts. Interesting thoughts. There is a full body of research on memory and I just want to mention several aspects of the research on memory, some of it I've already, of which I've already spoken, but just to refresh, um, working memory we know is limited um, based on chronological age of the learner, but we also have to consider outside influences such as stress, anxiety, medicine, and um, patterns of sleep, eating, um, the house in which the child or the home in which the child is being raised. So there are all kinds of ways that that attention span or working memory can be um, affected. So in any normal circumstance, children do not necessarily all have seven minutes to be um, able to pay attention and use working memory effectively because there are many factors that influence that. Um, we are wired to learn seven items. And this I find very interesting that in school sometimes um, we ask students to memorize or learn or pay attention to many more than seven items. And this is like a general um, number. And if a child is very young, of course, you're not going to ask the child to learn seven vocabulary words in a lesson or learn seven different methodologies in mathematics, but the maximum that we can retain and process in a learning episode is seven items. So we wanna keep that in mind. Um, and that is even at the college level, at the adult level, seven is truly the magic number. Memory stores and patterns, which we've already talked about, but the idea is we have to connect what students know to what they are learning and help sequence that information for storage and for long-term memory. We actually process what we learn during sleep. So within 24 hours, if the information is stored and we can, um, discuss that information or um, we can be asked questions about that which we learned the day before then the teacher recognizes that yes indeed the student has stored that in long-term memory but to keep it there we need rehearsal and practice so multiple rehearsals and much practice is required so that uh, the long-term memory is strengthened because the neural connections are strengthened but having said that, we must remember that we need to teach things, um, I mean, in a way that um, the learner has received that uh, in, in, in sort of like, if I could say it this way, practice makes perfect, but that's not true. Perfect practice makes perfect. So if I've learned something in school and I go home and I practice incorrectly, or I'm um, using the algorithm incorrectly, or I don't understand something that I've learned and I'm practicing it, and my mind is going to store that through rehearsal. And it's much harder to unlearn something than it is to learn it correctly. So therefore, a teacher has to really be sure when a child is practicing information that he or she learned that day, perhaps in a homework situation, that the child fully comprehends what was taught so that he or she is not practicing something incorrectly and storing it in long-term memory incorrectly. Um, we want to teach through chunking our lessons and chunking is a teacher term. It just means abbreviated direct instruction based on the chronological age of the child. So we want to teach in short bursts of instruction and then give students or the learner a lot of time to process and practice and um, and use the information. So very, very important um, aspect of direct instruction in that we need to abbreviate it 
to provide it in shorter chunks. Convergence zones has to do with the fact that the brain stores in different areas of the cerebrum. So it will converge the information. It will cross-reference, if you will, if we teach using the full brain. So the more we stimulate students in many different ways, such as visually, auditorily, kinesthetically, the better the information will be converged in the brain and long-term memory will be strengthened because the information was stored in different, different parts of the brain. And plasticity, neuroplasticity has to do with the idea that the brain can change and through proper stimulation, the brain can learn many new, um, new bits of information, many new concepts. There are several more learning principles presented by the Keynes, and in this group, I will just discuss briefly each one of them. First, we know that we need to learn skills or facts within meaningful context. So in a situation, in any, any of the content areas in school, if we're strictly learning facts and we have no application, we can't make meaning of those facts, the brain won't remember it. It doesn't retain them. It has to be connected to a meaningful context. So if you're teaching, let's say, math facts, and there's no application of them in a meaningful context, such as a word problem, or how do we use multiplication in real life or division, then the retention level will be based generally on the idea that the child has nothing to connect that to. So the memory will not be strong on uh, the idea of learning a fact without contextual meaningful information to which it's connected. So if you're teaching a child to read and the child is learning phonics and then how to use phonics to, um, to say words, pronounce words, and then after that, the child learns the word in cont context such as in a story or in a sentence and then in a story, we're building context for reading, it's, it's really important because learning a word without its context is just, um, it's not easily connected. There's no real strong neural connection to a word without a meaningful context. We know we learn in patterns. This has been said many times throughout the presentation, but connecting, connecting that which we learn connecting the subject areas. Um, stop teaching in silos. In other words, I go to math class and it has nothing to do with reading, which has nothing to do with science, etc. But a teacher that provides connectedness across the curriculum and connectedness within subject areas is doing a much better job helping the child to learn the information for long-term uh, storage and retrieval. We learn parts and wholes simultaneously. This is how the brain functions. So when, you're, when you are looking at a gestalt or a whole concept, you've got to break it into the parts and let the brain absorb and learn and practice the individual parts. At the same time, if we're teaching pieces of something, the, ch the brain needs to see the whole picture. So remembering that is very important parts and holes need to be taught simultaneously. Making sense, that's all, the whole idea here, is making sense of the smaller pieces because the brain um, perceives things both in segmented aspects, such as the part, but also through the gestalt or the whole. We learn both consciously and unconsciously. So there are things we're learning that we're not even aware of in our environment in our world, and then there are conscious learning um, episodes such as now. But that which you've already known about the brain or which you think you know about teaching or perhaps what you, what you experienced in school is, is part of what's going on right now, the unconscious part of learning. And the last is that we know that emotions control learning. So in a situation where the child feels comfortable and is more of a homeostatic situation, 
the child will be able to learn better. Any learner will do better if he or she is has a, an emotional stability. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about um, how we learn and how it's connected to the brain. I um, offer professional development to educators, to um, artists, to different people who teach um, both children and adults. And um, a lot of what I talk about is arts learning and the connection of the arts to how the brain functions. So um, there are many programs we offer in our region through the Intermediate Unit 19. I am the director of the Pennsylvania Arts Council Regional Partnership and have been for 30 years. In my role, I provide artist programming for schools and community groups. My personal research has been on creative aging and how the arts help older people um, keep cognitively stimulated and um, creative as um, we age. So once again, my contact is catcullen627 at gmail.com. And if you have any questions or you're interested in more information, please feel free to reach out to me. Once again, thank you.